Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about home interview fusion. I made a, can everybody hear me? Yeah, I, I have a, kind of a cold, so I'll do my best. I made a homemade nuclear, I made a nuclear fusion reactor in uh, undergrad back in Holland. And I can... Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> 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 like Apple PC. Yeah, uh, there, there were some technical related problems. Uh, so my name is Sander Mann. I'm from the Netherlands. I'm a visiting student here at Columbia. Uh, I'm, I'm working on photovoltaics. I kind of switched from this, and you, <laughs> you'll know why when I'm done. Um, uh, so the overview of my talk, I'm basically going to talk about two things: the, the basics, the basic physics behind fusion. Uh, I, I'll try to keep it elementary, and uh, how to build one yourself, which is the second part. So. Uh, to, to start, um, we're gonna uh, go take a step back and uh, just refresh everybody's memory on what an atom is. Now I've tried to. This is supposed to be a helium-4 atom. Uh, you see the, the electrons orbiting the nucleus, which is here. Um, the nucleus of an helium-4 atom contains four elementary particles: two neutrons, two protons. The proton is positively charged. The neutron is neutral. And the size of which we're talking, this is very small, is one angstrom an atom, which is 10 to the power minus 10 meters, which is the scientific notation for what you see below there. And I'm not going to do that every time, because uh, we have much bigger numbers coming up uh, in a bit. Um, and then there's, of course, the electron, the one that's orbiting it. And the nucleus itself is a lot smaller even, it's 10 to the power minus 15 meters. So the scientific notation for this thing, or the, the, I don't know, yeah, you can call it scientific, is um, a 4 over 2 helium. It means that there's 4 particles in the nucleus, of which 2 are protons. Now, the next thing, go ahead, yeah, thank you, uh, is that you should know is what a plasma is. A plasma is a not that common uh, state of matter. Well, it is common in the universe, but not common here on Earth. And it is, it, it is what comes after gas. So if you heat something up even further, it becomes a plasma. And in the plasma, the electrons orbiting the nucleus, left, they're, they're separated. As you can see here, you get a cloud. This is a terrible representation of plasma, but it will do. <laughs> you have like a, a cloud of positively charged nuclei. Here it is. It has the 2 plus because it lost its two negative charges. And some electrons roaming about. And we are interested in these in these positive nuclei, because that's what we're going to be fusing. In this case, we're talking about a different atom, uh, an isotope of hydrogen called deuterium. And we're going to discuss this one, because this is the one that I fused with my friends back in Holland. Um, so this is an isotope of hydrogen. Hydrogen has one proton, it is the lightest element, and it's an isotope because it has an additional, this one, deuterium, has an additional neutron. And if you fuse them, if you smash them together hard enough, they fuse, they, you get some reaction products, in this case either helium and a neutron or 50-50 chance you get tritium, another isotope of hydrogen and hydrogen itself or a proton. And why is this interesting? Why is everybody, why is there so much buzz about this thing? Go ahead. Well it turns out that there is uh, a mass difference between what you start with, the two deuterons, and what you end up with, the helium and the neutron. And uh, I, I wrote it out. It's not that much. See, the, the two deuterons weigh 6.691 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms, which is a lot of zeros. The reactants weigh, in the thousandth place, about 5 minus 10 to the minus 27 kilograms less, which you see here. So 5 times 10 to the minus 30 kilograms. And that is not that much, but it, it disappeared in the form of energy. So it didn't disappear, but it transformed into energy. And to find out how much that is, we get to use Einstein's famous equation, E is MC squared, finally. Um, so if we do, because uh, everybody wanted to use that equation once, right? <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's been wanting to. Yeah. So the mass, we just found out, is 5 times 10 to the minus 30 kilograms. C, the speed of light, is squared is 9 times 10 to the 16 meters per squared per second squared. So if you uh, take the product, you get 4.5 times 10 to the minus 30 joule. The joule being a unit of energy, those light bulbs use about 60 joules per second. Which, so that will give you an idea of how much a joule is, and also how little this is. But, if you convert it to how much kilogram of deuterium we produce, you get this number, 
which is 1 by 35 times 10 to the power of 14, which is an immense amount of, um, of energy. It is incomprehensible, so I will give an example here. An ordinary glass of water, H2O, so that's two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, uh, holds about 7 uh, a million, yeah, times 10 to the minus 6 kilograms of deuterium, because deuterium is a naturally occurring isotope. So, like every little bit of uh, every little bit of water contains some deuterium in a trace amount, but this is enough to produce 260 kilowatt hours of power, which is enough to uh, basically supply uh, power to a Dutch an, an entire Dutch household for more than a month, or a Europe, an American household for 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, no offense. <laughs> Now, if it, if it is so great and there's so much energy, then why don't we all just do it? And that basically has to do with the fact that these two positive deuterons, they repel. Just like two magnets, I draw two magnets, if you try to put the same poles together, they repel as well. It's the same force, it basically works the same, but the repulsion and the electromagnetic in the, in the case of deuterons is a lot bigger. So, you can see that here, uh, it, it's, it, the, the repulsion is an inverse square law, meaning that uh, as the distance gets smaller, the repulsion gets larger and larger and larger in, 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 in the square way. So, but at a certain point here, at 10 to the power of minus 15 meters, another fundamental um, a law takes over, or force, the strong interaction, which is basically the, the force that keeps atoms together. And it is 100 times as strong. So as soon as it has reached that point, the neutron, they, they snap together and they are fused. They form the, the products. And so to get it up there, you can see you can see this thing basically as a hill. And and I'm here trying to get a soccer ball up that hill. What you do is on the gravity, you, you try you just kick it harder and harder until it gets over. And that's basically what you try with atoms as well. You have to give them speed. And speed and kinetic energy, everybody's probably seen that top equation in uh, high school physics. The kinetic energy of a particle, or, or anything, a bowling ball, is half mv squared. The kinetic energy an, a deuteron needs is 4 kilo electron volts. And an electron volt is a unit that uh, physicists or particle physicists like to use for reasons that will become clear in, in like two slides. I, I will leave it at this for now. The, the optimum is at 15 kilo electron volts. So when you have like a gas that is at 15 kilo electron volts for each particle, you have the most fusion reactions occurring. Now what does this mean in terms of actual speed? Uh, if you calculate that, you find that for 4 kilo electron volts, the particle, the deuteron in this case, is going 386 miles per second. Or at the optimum, 50 kilo electron volts is 750 miles per second, which is from here to Chicago every second. So that's, that's fast. Now it gets even worse if you, try, if you find out what the temperature is, because uh, energy of gas and temperature are closely related through this thing, and I won't go into detail. Uh, it turns out that the temperature of a gas with an average velocity of 4 kilo of electron volt is 30 million degrees Kelvin, or 56 million degrees minus 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's twice as hot as the core of the sun. Which brings us to the, the problem, how can you hold something 30 million degrees Kelvin or 56 million degrees Fahrenheit together to try to extract energy from it. That's, that's the main problem. It's too hot and nothing holds it. So they come up with some really weird uh, stuff. Like this thing. Uh, this is a jet. This is a tokamak. Uh, Brian works on these things. Uh, it is the most studied device uh, to, to, uh, to extract power from nuclear fusion. And it is basically based on magnetic confinement, which means that you use a very strong magnetic field to keep the hot plasma from the wall of the containment. Because if you hit the wall, the wall would dissipate and you would lose your reactor. So that's what you want to prevent. But the record energy that they produced in one of these things, we use the Q factor. It means that the output from the fusion process uh, divided by the inputs needed to get it that hot and to keep it from the walls is 0 0.65. So they've almost reached what they call break even. And they need to go a lot further than that to extract useful power from this whole thing. Which they're trying to do at ITER, which is a new one they're building right now in southern France. The total construction cost is over $13 billion. And it's probably going up a lot more once, you know, once they're building it. They're, they expect the first um, experiments in 2018. And the expected Q factor is 10. 
Now, then, after that, they'll build one that go to 20 probably, but it will take a long time before you actually see fusion reactors like this delivering the power into the net. Now, meta. <coughs> The, the thing, the, the public misconception kind of is that it's not that hard to create a fusion reaction because literally 17 year old kids did it, did, which is what inspired me as being a 19 year old kid with five friends that, you know, I could do it too. The hard thing is to create a fusion reaction in such a way that you can sustain it for a longer period of time and extract power from it so that it becomes power positive instead of power consuming. Because the first thing with the kids you can do in a uh, in, in a Farnsworth fuser, which is uh, the thing on the uh, on the left bottom, um, and it, it, it basically it, it's a lot smaller. This it, it's about this big, um, and it, it's it, it's it consists of a vacuum vessel and a vacuum. You need the vacuum. The vacuum is like no air. That's how you describe it. So you pump out the air because once you have the particles colliding, you want deuterons to collide with deuterons, not with nitrogen or oxygen or other things. So first you need to get all the air out for which you need an airtight vessel. Then you put the vessel, then uh, once you have the vacuum, you, have, you let the deuterium, the deuterium in through the gas inlet. And then you have the electrostatic parts, which are, I, I, I kind of reproduced here. Um, and, and the outer one, the outer sphere, is at ground, meaning there's zero volt um, thing. The inner one, though, is crammed with electrons. It's, up, it's at a potential of minus 30 kilovolts, and that's a lot. It's, it's, uh, very dangerous, and because it is so negative, it attracts positive particles. So once we have those positive particles in the plasma again, that I showed at the beginning, or in this case the deuterons, uh, they are attracted towards the center. And now the beauty is that the center is transparent, it's just wires, so some will slip from all sides and they will collide in the center. And their energy is, and here is why kilo electron volt is such a nice unit, the potential is 30 kilovolts, uh, the charge is 1 E, so the kinetic energy is 30 kilo electron volt, which is very convenient. 30 kilo electron volt is more than enough to make them fuse, so some will actually fuse in the center. And this is a device this big that you can build and you know, you can actually assemble it completely yourself. It is limited, of course, otherwise these would be everywhere, producing power in your car or wherever, because the, 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 these particles will not all go through the maze, they will also hit the actual uh, sphere itself, heating it, and it will eventually melt at high enough intensity. And these intensities are not high enough, not nearly high enough to produce power. 